In this presentation, we're going to be looking at uh, the notion of perspective, and in particular, the type of perspective that we're going to be dealing with uh, in this course. So the idea of perspective is actually quite broad. It can have lots and lots of meanings uh, on many levels. So uh, from the sort of psychological level in the upper left to, you know, quite a physical way of, of looking at things differently. Uh, so roughly translated, perspective is a, just a particular way of seeing things. Uh, now, for most people, uh, perspective is much more specific than that. It has to do with, uh, in terms of the arts, it has to do with the way that we visually represent something uh, that's three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. And what we have uh, are actually multiple ways of doing this. And in terms of perspective, there are multiple types of perspective. So if I was to say these are three cubes, uh, if you were to look at them, is there one that you would say is correct? And you can stop the video if you'd like and think about it for a minute. But for most people, uh, they would say yes, the one on the left is, is correct. Uh, be, because it seems to be doing what we see in the actual physical world. Well, this is actually a very particular type of perspective. Uh, it's one based on how we see things. But there are other types of visual representation used by cultures throughout the world uh, that have different ideas, different priorities of, of what they prioritize uh, in terms of what gets represented and how things are represented. So the one in the middle uh, is referred to as isometric perspective. And you'll notice that the lines going back in space don't actually come together. So if we look at the linear perspective, if we look at the lines that are going away from us on the cube, they seem to be appearing to converge, come together at some point, whereas these lines actually remain parallel. Uh, and then a third type of perspective, known as inverse perspective, seems to imply that was, as the lines go back away from the viewer, they actually go further away uh, from each other. They diverge from each other. These are actually three types of perspective um, that have been employed historically. So we'll go through one, we'll go through them one at a time. So in linear perspective, like I said, everything seems to come to a point. And this is the idea that if you actually look at the world, things do get smaller the further they are away from you. So a road, for instance, a wide road gets narrower and narrower uh, as we go to the into the distance. Uh, if we look at things that are far away, they are smaller. And there's lots of photographs on the internet that um, address this particular topic. But this is an optical phenomenon, and an optical phenomenon that was used and exploited by Western artists uh, throughout Greece and Rome, and also throughout the Renaissance. This is a painting by Masaccio. And if you notice, uh, the way the buildings, the design of the buildings, the architecture of the buildings, the lines that are going away from us all seem to converge on one point, and not accidentally that point appears to be Jesus, uh, in this very particular painting. Or likewise, this painting by Carlo Crivelli. If, again, you look at the building, all the lines that are receding meet at a very, very particular point. And we'll talk about this point later. It's called the vanishing point. So this is the idea that uh, things that are close to you are larger and things that are further away from you are smaller. And if they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, then they seem to stop at a very particular point. However, isometric perspective is a very different way of thinking about objects. And this is something that's very popular in, um, in the history of art in terms of Asian, uh, particularly Chinese, Japanese, and Korean art. When they would portray largely uh, you know, parallel objects like boxes and buildings, they tended not to make them come together. And this was a very confusing thing for many people uh, in the West because it made sense that if you're trying to represent something, it has to be smaller to the, fur the further away it is. Uh, but in terms of what they were trying to get at, they were trying to get at the essence of an object. What is its truth? What is its reality? And if a box is actually parallel in reality, then it should be parallel in representation. So they had a very different way of thinking about how to represent uh, things visually. It wasn't optically based. 
Uh, it was based on the truth of the objects. All right, so it wasn't based on your eye and how you saw, because if you think about it, what you see with your eye is an illusion. It's a trick. The road we just saw does not get narrower and narrower the further away it goes from you. That's just a trick of the eye. It's an optical illusion. Um, and so many artists uh, working in China and Japan and South Korea were not interested in these tricks of the eye, these illusions. Uh, they were interested in portraying things in a way that was uh, most clearly understandable. And if a box was parallel on its sides, then you would portray it parallel. We see that all throughout uh, Asian art. And so here is an example of isometric perspective uh, in a traditional Japanese image. Uh, and here we have it in a uh, Chinese print. And again, you see the lines on the floor, the lines on the table. Uh, they do not converge. They do not get smaller and smaller and closer and closer together the further away we go. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't have some art that um, had that particular type of linear perspective. Of course, uh, they obviously did. Uh, but their, by and large, their convention, their way of portraying things uh, was more interested in addressing the reality of things rather than the way that the eye would respond to things. And then the final uh, example of perspective that I just wanted to show you is called inverse perspective. If you look at this, the vanishing point, which is the point we, we call where all the lines converge, is actually in front of the image. Uh, and in this case, it's in front of the actual uh, picture. Here, it goes back into the distance. Uh, if we go back into the distance, it gets wider and wider and bigger and bigger. So only when we flip it around do we actually come to a vanishing point. And this was very popular in a lot of religious art uh, based on the Byzantine style. And if you think about uh, the purpose of religious art is that we often see many, many religious paintings in galleries and museums, but they were never intended to be there. Religious art was meant to be uh, seen in context, uh, in chapels, in churches, and things like that. And in that context, religious art would have been, been engaged with uh, at a spiritual, contemplative level. And so it wasn't about looking at art and admiring its composition, its colors, and its expression, and its realism. The art was there to serve a very particular purpose, and that purpose was as an intermediary between the human and the divine. And as a result, the vanishing point was the point of the person, the person looking at the icon or the image of, of Christ, uh, the person who's praying in front of the painting, who's uh, uh, spiritually contemplating the divine realm. And so the vanishing point was meant to be the soul of the person who's uh, relating to the image. And we see lots of examples of this in Byzantine art. Uh, here is uh, Christ's child uh, in, a, in a crib or a cradle. He's, he's got the sort of rocking legs here. But notice we see, the, we see both sides. We see the front and we see the top, which is physically impossible. And then we connect the vanishing points of the uh, lines that recede. We find that the vanishing point, again, is in front of the image. Or in this picture, if we look at the footstool, this is Mary and Jesus. Uh, we see that although we don't see both sides of the footstool, we do see that as it goes back, it diverges, gets further away, and as it comes forward, it converges. Um, another way of thinking about this is it's it's seen from God's perspective. So if God was on the other side of the image looking, then the vanishing point would be receding and going away from him. Uh, and so that uh, would create a reversal in, in the image. Uh, so perspective is interesting because it's not just one type of perspective. There are many, many types of perspective depending on the cultural uh, desire and priority in terms of visual representation. So that's one thing we want to get clear is that perspective is contextual. It depends on the culture. What we're working with is a very particular type of perspective known as linear perspective. All right, so we're interested in this linear, which because this course is based on how things look to the eye, optical. It's not about conceptual ideas. But I just want to let you um, know about this so that you, you realize that you know there is no correct way of doing things. There's just correct in terms of what is it you're trying to achieve? What is your goal? What is your priority? What is 
uh, your, your cultural sort of framework within which to uh, represent images. And so this is what we are particularly focused on, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of this presentation. So essentially, if, if this is the picture plane, uh, and what I mean by that is, is the canvas or the pad or the drawing. What you look at, here, here's the eye looking. Uh, if something's closer to the viewer, it will appear bigger as indicated by this blue line. If it's further away to the viewer, it will appear smaller, again, as indicated by the blue line. Uh, so this is what we're going to be working with. Uh, and in Western art, this whole concept of perspective uh, got very, very complicated and complex and rich and detailed. And you know, I can imagine, you know, for many students, it, it's pretty off-putting. It's very, a lot of geometry or math or science, uh, almost the opposite of what people would think of as art. But I want to kind of impress upon you that it's really not that complicated. It's actually very, very simple. Uh, the simple principle has to do with getting smaller as you go away, and I'll elucidate that principle uh, in a little bit. So in the history of Western art, lots and lots of devices, whoops, sorry about that, techniques, methods were devised uh, that allowed artists to try and figure out how to portray something in perspective on a 3D surface. And so the history of Western art is just littered with attempts uh, to create, you know, panes of glass with grids on them uh, or windows with string that would be attached to things so that artists could figure out how do we portray something 3D on a 2D surface? How do we create this optical effect? And, and this was particularly Western. Most of the world, uh, if we took all the art that humankind has produced and metaphorically, uh, hypothetically, we put it in a room, uh, it would fit inside a very small um, paint can, all the art that was realistic. All right. In other words, what humans have been doing historically has not really been about realistic art. This has been a very particularly Western conception. And what I mean by realistic is optically uh, realistic, uh, as in this image. This idea of portraying things like this, as the eye sees it, is a very Western uh, preoccupation. It surfaced with the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, disappeared uh, for over a millennia with uh, the influence of Christianity and reappeared in the Renaissance in the 15th century uh, in Italy and then came to define a lot of uh, Western art since then. But it's certainly not the idea of art for really most of humanity and for most of the world um, from a temporal or a geographical point of view. Uh, but this is what we're doing. This is what our, our course is about representing things as they appear to the eye. So what I want to do is I want to go through the concepts of perspective, um, explain them to you in a very kind of clear, simple way that hopefully dispels a lot of the kind of fear or misunderstanding surrounding it. Okay, so this is a diagram uh, similar to what we just saw, uh, where things that are wide and, and big that are closer to us get smaller and smaller and smaller uh, as they go back. And so they come to a point on a line, and that line is called the horizon line. And the horizon line happens to be the eye level. So if you look out straight, you're not looking up, you're not looking down, you look straight, the horizon is always straight ahead. You can be up in an airplane at 36,000 feet and you look out the window, you do not look down, you look straight up. You could be down at sea level. You could be at the beach with your head down at the sand and the horizon you do not look up to. It's straight out. So the horizon and the eye level are the exact same thing. And this is an important line uh, in learning to understand perspective. Where lines that go away from you, and I should say this now, parallel lines, lines that are parallel to each other, where they appear to touch or meet is called the vanishing point. And that vanishing point in the type of perspective we're doing right now is always on the horizon line. Now these lines that go back, these parallel lines, whether they're on a box or a road or whatever, 
Uh, technically, they're called orthogonals, um, a word that I think is probably the one of the ugliest sounding words in the English language. So hopefully I will, well, I will try not to use that word at all again in this presentation or in future presentations. I just refer to them as receding parallel lines. Okay, so really linear perspective can be reduced to this sentence. All lines that are parallel to each other, meaning in the real world, roads, boxes, tables, chairs, rooms, meet at the exact same vanishing point, and that vanishing point is on the horizon. Now this applies to one and two point perspective, which I'll explain in a minute. But this sentence, I encourage you to write in reverse on your forehead, so that when you look in the mirror in the morning, you will be able to read it. I guarantee you, when you're stuck with your drawing, with your perspective drawing, this is the one sentence that's going to unstuck you. All right. So the problem with perspective is not understanding what it is. The problem with perspective is understanding how to apply it. And what I mean by that is when you're drawing objects, when you're drawing rooms, buildings, things, you forget about this concept. And if you're stuck and you don't know what to do, if you refer to this concept, I guarantee you nine times out of 10, it's going to get you out of trouble. Okay, so let's take this as an example. Here's a road uh, going back to the horizon. Uh, because we live in Hawaii, let's pretend, you know, here's Honolulu on the horizon and, and this is Kailua down here. And it's a two lane road. So it's, it's the old poly road, right? It's heading back to Honolulu. Uh, two lanes going the other way. Let's pretend, well, let's not pretend, the reality was uh, traffic got really busy. Populations grew, the poly wasn't big enough, so the state decided to expand it. Instead of having two lanes, they wanted, they built another road next to it, and they had that road go one direction and the original road go another direction. Okay? So what I'd like you to do is stop the video, take a piece of paper out, and draw next to the old one a road going the other way with two lanes from Kailua to Honolulu. So I'll go back to here so you can see it. What we want to do is make another one of these roads. All right, so stop the video now and start it when you're ready. Okay, so it's not unusual for people to draw something like this. All right, so there's two roads next to each other. But if you did draw this, then you just forgot the sentence that I just described to you. Because think about this. What's going to happen down here? These two are actually going to meet and they're going to have a road traffic accident. If this road is parallel to this road, where must this point be? It has to be over here. Okay, so this is what it should look like. So this is what I mean by you know, perspective is easy in theory and complicated in practice. If you remember that this road is parallel to this road, which it would be in real life, then it has to meet at the exact same vanishing point as this one. This is referred to as one point perspective. One point meaning there's actually one point where all the receding parallel lines go to. And so, you know, you can find different ways of, of portraying this. These are boxes floating in space. Uh, the horizon line is the eye level, right? So these technically are below your eye level, so you can see the tops of the boxes. This is above your eye level, so you see the bottom of the box, which makes complete and total sense. So this is a type of linear perspective. Linear meaning it gets smaller and it recedes to a vanishing point. And it's referred to as one point because there's actually just one point where all these things meet. And it's one of the most common types of representation uh, in the visual arts. Uh, if you take a photograph of something that's really long, it's got a, a, a wall in the back and you're facing it, it's going to be in one point perspective. Everything is going to go to that point. Um, another image where you can see these lines here on the, on the floor actually converging at this one point. And this was uh, rediscovered 
in the 15th century um, by a couple of Italians, uh, Brunelleschi being the main, the main artist. And it was something picked up by another Italian artist, Masaccio. Uh, and he, this was actually the first painting in linear perspective since uh, the Greek and Roman era, which is, you know, in terms of time, uh, over a thousand years. All right, so this painting was painted on the wall uh, of a church in Florence, and the vanishing point, if you look at the lines on the ceiling, came to a point about here in the painting, and that just happened to be exactly, hang on, Okay, there's something, there we go. Exactly the height of the average human being, which is five foot six in terms of eye level. So what this means is that when somebody stood in front of this painting and looked at it from this particular point of view, it looked like there was a hole in the wall and this went back in space. That this was an extension of the church. And so that's what linear perspective was capable of doing, is creating this illusion of depth of going back in space. Um, and so ever since the Italian Renaissance, artists have been using linear perspective to create these spaces, these rooms, these boxes that were believable, that were realistic, that you could put people in and create narratives and scenarios. And so we look at this particular painting, notice all the lines. Uh, I won't say the word orthogonal, I will say parallel lines as they go away from the viewer, from the ceiling or the window or the tiles on the floor, all meet at one point, which is the eye level. So it tells you that the artist's eye, uh, whether it's a camera or a painting, was right here height-wise. So the artist was, was taller than this gentleman. In terms, you know, his eyes were higher, uh, smaller than the woman. So I'm assuming the artist was sitting down, but was probably a tall uh, person. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, one of the most famous paintings in the history of Western art. If you look at the room surrounding Jesus and the apostles during the Last Supper, all the lines that line up from the tops uh, of the door and, and the coffered ceiling all meet at one point. And that point, unsurprisingly, is Jesus. So, you know, the vanishing point was not just a point of emphasis for for depth and space, but obviously a point of emphasis for what was most important in the paintings at a time when painting was very, very religious. Uh, even a painting like this, The Ideal City, uh, whose authorship is, is disputed. Uh, originally, we thought it was uh, an artist called Raphael, a very famous Renaissance painter. Uh, now it might be Martini, and, and, uh, scholars are debating. But if you look at it, it's a very complex painting of a city scene. It's made up, it's completely uh, fabricated in the mind of the artist, uh, hence the title, The Ideal City. But it's actually very, very simple. All the lines go to one point, and that point is right here uh, in the doorway. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this concept of one-point perspective. Uh, here is a building in, in the art department at KCC. Uh, I took a photograph. You can see where all the lines converge. They converge at an eye level line. That line is the height uh, at which this photograph was taken. And you can see if this is a wall, there's the ceiling, there's the floor. That's where the camera was. That's the height of the camera, which is the eye level of uh, the photographer and the artist. And these next few images are drawings by students. We'll come back to these next week. These are rooms on the KCC campus. And you can see where all these lines are converging at a particular point. Uh, in the back of the picture. Okay, so that was one point perspective. Uh, but if you take something and you look at the corner or you look at the angle of it, you get something called two point perspective. And two point perspective means that all lines that are parallel is the same rule. So the top of the box, the bottom of the box, and this side, they are parallel to each other, so they meet at the same vanishing point. These lines, on the other hand, are different. They're not parallel to these lines, but these three, this one, this one, and this one, are parallel to each other, so they will meet at the same vanishing point. So this is a different type of linear perspective. It's called two-point, uh, for obvious reasons. And it's when we look at something obliquely. We look at something uh, where we're looking at the corner, whether it's we're on the outside, so we see the outside of a box, 
over on the inside where we see the inside of our room. And here's some examples of two-point perspective. Again, the horizon line is the eye level. If you see it below, we see the top. Everything's going up. If we see it on the horizon, notice the bottom comes up, but the top comes down. And if we see it above the horizon, we see the bottom of the box. And this is a very popular type of perspective, uh, and it's used um, to make all sorts of weird drawings and shapes, the most common of which are architectural drawings. So a lot of architectural drawings of buildings, uh, especially from the outside, are two-point perspective. Here's the corner. This elaborate building is really just a box. Uh, and if we break down the, the diagonals and the parallel lines and the eye level, we get something like this. Notice that the vanishing point for two-point perspective is often off the picture, at least for one of them. One of them might be in the picture, but you rarely, uh, almost never, will have both vanishing points in the picture. If you do, it looks very unusual, very distorted. If you go inside a building and look into the corner, you also have two-point perspective. So this is a wall. The floor and the ceiling are parallel to each other, which means they meet at the same point. And if you look where that point is, it's over here. This wall is different. So its parallel lines will meet over here. So we draw them in, we get this. So it looks very complicated, uh, but it's really quite simple if you think about it. But notice that these two points are on the same line. And again, this is the eye level. And then finally, there's a third type of perspective that we might be, uh, you might be coming across in your drawing, and that's called three-point perspective. And that would be if you took a box in two-point perspective and you said, okay, what parallel lines are left? Well, the middle and the sides. If they came to a point, that would be the third point. All right, so perspective can get very, very complicated. Um, but the basic principle is really the same. Parallel lines meet at the same point. In one and two point perspective, those two points are on the horizon line. In three point perspective and other types of perspective, they don't necessarily have to be on the horizon line. So this is three point perspective. Uh, it's often used to portray, uh, let's say buildings uh, from a bird's eye view when you're up here and things are parallel lines are going away from you, it goes down below. And likewise, you could turn it around and look up the other direction and see it going away. And then there are also various versions of perspective. This is called inclined plane. So if you're doing a roof on a building, the building is basically a cube. That cube is in two-point perspective, but the angle of the roof uh, has its own vanishing point. And in this particular case, the vanishing point is straight above one of the two vanishing points on the horizon line. Similarly with a box, uh, if you've got a flap on a box, let's think of a Chinese takeaway for instance, that flap has two parallel lines. Uh, if it was completely open and level, it would meet here. Uh, but if you angle it up, that point is still gonna meet at the same point and that point happens to be straight up. So perspective is incredibly logical. It makes logical sense, and it can get as complicated as you want to get. There's one point, two point, three point, four point, ten point, hundred point, million point perspective. Uh, there's no limit to how many uh, vanishing points you can have. What we want to do is master one and two point perspective for this course. So hopefully this makes a lot of sense to you. Um, it's the basic principles of perspective. If you look at the two assignments that you've uh, been given for this week, uh, there's a couple of presentations and they will talk uh, a little bit more in detail about one and two point perspective uh, in terms of that assignment.